they walk through remote areas where the temperatures reach triple digits to evade immigration officials. Some will never make it, drowning while crossing the river or perishing while trying to keep up with smugglers who have left them behind. But despite the dangers, the migrants continue to come. Data released earlier this month by Customs and Border Protection show that nearly 47,000 people were either apprehended by the Border Patrol or turned themselves into custom officers last month at ports of entry along the southwest border after traveling from mostly Central American countries. Even though hundreds of children separated from their families after crossing the border have been released under court order, the overall number of detained migrant children has exploded to the highest ever recorded. Population levels at federally contracted shelters for migrant children have quietly shot up more than five-fold since last summer reaching a total of 12,800 this month compared to the 2,400 such children in custody in May of last year. The huge increases are due not to an increase of children entering the country, but a reduction in the number being released to live with families and other sponsors. Roughly the same number of children are crossing the border as in years past. The big difference, said those familiar with the shelter system, is that red tape and fear brought on by stricter immigration enforcement have discouraged relatives and family friends from coming forward to sponsor the children. The immigration crisis clogged our news headlines not more than a month or two ago, but lately our attention has been drawn to hurricanes, predator priests, and the background investigation of a Supreme Court justice candidate. So the average U.S. citizen can be forgiven for assuming that the immigration problem has been fixed due to the claims of our country's leadership of making America great again. In this morning's text, after having told his disciples a second time that he will soon be meeting his death, Jesus finds his disciples also concerned with making their nation great again, arguing among themselves about who will be responsible for that greatness. They seemed as willfully ignorant of Jesus' words that he would be betrayed and killed as we are of the almost 13,000 children being detained along our country's borders. And so Jesus redefined greatness for anyone who wanted to call themselves his followers, whether they be 1st century or 21st century followers. Whoever wants to be great, he said, must serve. Whoever wants to lead must stand at the back of the line. Greatness, he was trying to explain to them and us, has nothing to do with power. It has nothing to do with which political party controls Congress or who has the most income or which church attracts the most people. Greatness has to do with taking on a role of powerlessness while serving others. And then as if to illustrate the point, he scooped a little child into his arms and said this helpless, inconsequential child was a reflection of God. If you wanted to see God, take a good look at the youngster, not because the toddler is innocent and pure but because they are powerless. It may be tempting to sentimentalize the action of Jesus in picking up a small child and urging his followers to welcome one such child in his name as a way to welcome him. We imagine a sweet scene in which Jesus tenderly cuddles a child and appeals to the soft hearts under the tough exterior of these big rough men. It is indeed 
a sweet scene that we imagined, but that's not what was going on here. Children in the ancient world had no legal protections, no rights. Even St. Thomas Aquinas taught that in a raging fire, a husband was obliged to save his father first, then his mother, next his wife, and last of all, his young child. Children were servants who had no privileges. And these, Jesus said to his disciples who were jockeying for top position, these inconsequential servants were reflections of God. The way I read this morning's text then, we have thrown Jesus into cages along our country's border and we use circular arguments to justify our actions. Jesus in seeking refuge from violence has been caged like a wild animal and forgotten. May God have mercy on our souls. In today's text, Jesus lifts up lowly children as emissaries of God. But they weren't the only ones who were devalued during his day. They shared space on the margins with many others in their society who were both powerless and vulnerable. And throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus associates with them all. In the first chapter, it's with lepers and notorious sinners. In the fifth chapter, it's with a bleeding woman and a raging man possessed of a demon. In the seventh chapter, he heals the daughter of a Gentile wo woman. If we were to evaluate our country as great as we might imagine America to be, I think it would score low when it comes to Jesus' definition of greatness. But how might our congregation score when it comes to welcoming the least of these? Our Lady of Lords Catholic community offers this welcome to newcomers. We extend a special welcome to those who are single, married, divorced, gay, filthy rich, dirt poor, yo no habla inglés. We extend a special welcome to those who are crying newborn, skinny as a rail, or could afford to lose a few pounds. We welcome you if you sing like Andrea Bocelli or like our pastor who can't carry a note in a bucket. You're welcome if you're just browsing, just woke up, or just got out of jail. We don't care if you're more Catholic than the Pope or haven't been in church since little Joey's baptism. We extend a special welcome to those who are over 60 but not grown up yet and to teenagers who are growing up too fast. We welcome soccer moms, NASCAR dads, starving artists, tree huggers, latte sippers, vegetarians, junk food eaters. We welcome those who are in recovery or still addicted. We welcome you if you're having problems or you're down in the dumps or if you don't like organized religion, we've been there too. If you blew all your offering money at the, off, at the dog track, you're welcome here. We offer a special welcome to those who think the earth is flat, work too hard, don't work, can't spell, or because grandma is in town and wanted to go to church. We welcome those who are inked, pierced, or both. We offer a special welcome to those who could use a prayer right now, had religion shoved down your throat as a kid, or got lost in traffic and wound up here by mistake. We welcome tourists, seekers and doubters, bleeding hearts, and you. I would like to think this is a suitable, though a bit lengthy, welcome that might be appropriate for our own church. But ultimately, Jesus' call to greatness is one that goes out to each of us on a personal level. How are we doing when it comes to Jesus' definition of greatness? Are we as willing to offer aid to the person at the intersection holding a sign that says any help is appreciated as we are willing to offer a hug to the toddler we encounter in the grocery store? Make no mistake, this is tough stuff. Following Jesus isn't for sissies. It's 
for the strong of heart. It's for those who are willing to lay aside their egos in order to help out folks we would really rather pretend don't exist. That's what Jesus described as greatness. Following Jesus goes against everything we've been taught. It's countercultural. May we find within ourselves the courage to follow Jesus by welcoming into our world those who are inconsequential, whether they are immigrants seeking refuge or homeless folks seeking a handout. For in doing so, we welcome God into our midst. Amen.